Welcome to With the Greatest Respect, our first guest, Bill Kelty. The Wikipedia notes will say he is a well-known Labor figure and unionist, but he is so much more than that. Bill played a critical and frankly a pivotal role in the reform of the Australian economy in the 1980s and 1990s. And without his vision, guile and leadership and intellect, we may not have seen the likes of superannuation reform, the Accord, Medicare and Labor reform, all of which is referenced in this interview. He's a remarkable Australian and a very humble and understated one as well. Australia owes him a great debt as he worked with Hawke and Keating and others to set the platform up for economic growth and a greater living standards for Australians. Well, it's my great privilege to introduce Bill Kelty, probably one of the most significant and important Australians of the last 50 years. Good afternoon, Bill. Good afternoon. So, Bill, as I started to think about over the course of the last couple of weeks how I did this podcast, um, I sort of started feeling a little inferior because it's such a, a wonderful life and a life full of great achievement. I hope I can do it justice. Um, but I, th- I should let the listeners know that uh, I have a very special relationship with you, which probably does give me some credentials and bona fides. Um, you've been like a father figure to me for many years now. And I want to start uh, with a trip that we did together when you took me uh, and a couple of other gentlemen across to to America. We visited a few uh, US presidential libraries. And there was a day that we went to Hyde Park in uh, upstate New York to visit the Franklin D. Roosevelt Museum. And the look on your face as you showed me through and we walked through that pretty much for the whole day it was a it was a wonderful day and I got a real insight into some of your beliefs. He was a political hero to you, wasn't he? Oh, the Roosevelt's political heroes, uh, but he was in particular uh, because he changed the culture of the United States. He made it a better, fairer country. And it was, ag- it was against the conventional wisdom. Australia started off as a nation with a commitment to make it a, a better, fairer country, but, but he actually did change the, the United States uh, and his wife was just wonderful. You know, they were advocates for pe- for peace, and for women, and for unions, and a decent society. They w- they were two of the most wonderful leaders of the century. And his cousin Theodore was a great environmentalist, practical environmentalist, starting the national parks. So when you look at the impact of the Roosevelts on the U.S. economy and society, uh, I think I think they were the most significant family in the history of that country in terms of the humanisation of the nation, just making it a much better society. And they were heroes. Uh, they were, were great heroes. And Bill, if, if we look at some of the philosophies and guiding principles that have guided you into some of your strategic calls you've made and the policies that you've decided to embark on with obviously a lot of help, which we'll get in through the course of this, of this call, but... The thing that keeps coming up in the research that I did and the conversations you, you and I have had is the safety net. So it's it's almost creating an environment, a community for everybody, not just some but not just some people, but everybody. And I think the three safety nets you've talked to uh, over the course of our friendship around wages, health, and retirement, particularly. Do you want to talk a bit about those safety nets and and the guiding principles well, you've well, had? Well, let me just go to the philosophy first because. I think the philosophy broadly reflects a third way in terms of political thought. Like I was brought up with a mum who was very close to the Communist Party and was a great supporter of many of the things that the communist nations were doing. But I wasn't. I was never a communist. I never supported communism. I did, however, support uh, a labour view of life. Uh, that is, you look after people. So if you look at the DNA of which is behind... I think Labor Party political strategy, but particularly like Hawke and Keating, and, and, and I shared it, was it actually has three components. That it has a socialist base. That is, you don't leave people behind in society. You have decent wage rates, decent health care, and decent education, decent retirement benefits. These are the essential safety nets. You just don't leave people behind. On the other hand, you don't do it through governments, just by governments. Uh, I think all of us, 
would be in the same category. That is, we're anti-government authority for government authority. We don't believe in building big bureaucracies. So have a very pluralist model. That is, you have other groups, you know, churches, union, businesses, business organisations, unions, are all part of making a society. It's a pluralist model. And the third thing I think is a bit different is in, in our DNA, you had to be very practical. So your practical achievement meant that you had to get an economy which was responding to the market and adjusting to the market. So that's the three elements of the DNA, I think, of, of the Hawke-Keating model that we embraced. And, and that, that's always been the three elements in my life. The, the key safety nets, education is a very important safety net. Without access to education, there's just a reduction in opportunity. But the three big industrial ones, the things that you can actually negotiate yourself or with others, uh, was Medicare, uh, was uh, high minimum wage rates, minimum wage system, and and you can negotiate superannuation retirement benefits. So industrially, they were the three key things which you had the greatest impact on in terms of negotiating. And Bill, I'm going to talk a moment about your views on the modernise, modernising economies and the adjustments that you need to make to get equilibrium. So we'll, we'll cover that. But you just referenced something back then around that you weren't a communist. You grew up in uh, with your mother, sort of, um, I think we'll get to that, that she subscribed to a, a magazine called The Soviet Woman. But what mm. what would you what would you actually say of your political... Um, so... I know that there's parts of capitalism that you absolutely embrace, there's parts of socialism that you embrace. How would you characterise your political uh, persuasion and, and, and your beliefs? Oh, I think I'm ambiguously a social democrat. I believe in democracy, but I believe that democracy is, is a, a function of a fair society. It only works best when it's fair, that you've got opportunity to be involved. And as we discussed with Roosevelt's, the two Roosevelt's, the thing that they pressed about that sense of American democracy was you know, the freedom from want, uh, the freedom from fear. You know, to, to be involved in the system, you had to be given resources and capacity. And, and that's what makes great democracies, is they're also fear of better societies if they work. You know, the, a democracy, just simply with a free market, it really works effectively. So great democracies have great social underpinnings. And I'd like to, if we, if we may, just touch on your, your childhood because it was a, uh, a difficult childhood. Your mum raised you, um, four, four siblings, uh, mm -hmm. or three siblings and yourself. Um, how would you describe your childhood in a few words? Oh, we were poor. I mean, we were very, very poor. In economic terms, in economic terms, we're very poor. Um, and my mother raising four children by herself with very little assistance was a really uh, heroic thing to do. Uh, my talk about home. heroes. She was, your, he, she was a hero. Oh, yes, she? of course she's a hero. My mm. mother was a... She didn't just get the Soviet woman. She, did, she got the Weekly Times as well and she got a range of other things. <laughs> um, but uh, she was a person that... We were poor, but only economically. We weren't poor when it came to ideas and, 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 and trying to understand the world. We were very rich. I mean, I don't think too many uh, families would be sitting around a table on a Sunday and, and talking about uh, elections and talking about political theories. And, you know, I was only nine or ten. Uh, so it was a wonderful opportunity uh, so it was only poor economically, and it was tough. I mean, Brunswick was really tough. Uh, tough kids, you know, tough society, and you had to learn one thing. In order to survive, you, you, uh, you couldn't get run over. You couldn't fall down. You, uh, if anybody hit you, you had to get up. You never, ever, ever stayed on the ground. You just had to always get up and fight and and it was a really in some sense a, a very tough environment physically uh, but I look back at it 
and it, it gave you the wherewithal uh, to do the really hard things. Uh, without that, you would have been a lot softer person. And how many jobs did your mum have to put you through well, she, school? Well, I think she would have three jobs. She, well, she, and your she, sister left school early to do that my, as well? No, my sister was brilliant. My sister was 15. She was top of the school, Coburg High School, just about in everything. But she left school uh, because girls uh, didn't work. Girls got married, had children. So although she was a champion scholar at the school... Nobody was saying, let's stay on Jean. And she went to work at 15. My brother went to work at 14 as a bricklayer. My other sister went to work at 15 or 16 as a nurse. So in a, in a sense, I was the lucky one. And what you didn't particularly like school, did you? I didn't like teachers, if I didn't like school. Uh, no, I wasn't a... I think I might have been one of the few people where people said I should... I was going to be expelled because I didn't come to school. I didn't think it was very logical to expel me for not coming to school, but anyway, they were, I didn't like teachers, so it, it, it meant that I did most of the study by myself and uh, sat down and worked very hard. I liked education and I liked schooling in the sense of learning things. Uh, f- for a variety of reasons, I think I... I never really got on that well with many of the teachers, which meant that the easiest way was to stay home and do it yourself. And um, <laughs> that's which is remarkable. Uh, when did you get a love of football? Because football, which we'll get to later, has formed a very significant part of your life. Was and you barrack for the Bombers. Did did that start then, or uh, did that come later? No, no. Australian rules was just part of your life when you grew up. My brother. Barry Fresnan, his mates Barry Fresnan. Uh, at three or four, you just hung around with your brother, and he was Barry King Fresnan. We didn't have footballs most of the time. We used to play with uh, rolled up socks in the living room. And the one thing I learned was that uh, it was very important to Essendon to win because we only ever did it when Essendon won. <laughs> We'd actually reprise the game, and my brother would be, he was always uh, various people. He was always Ken Fraser and it was always Ron Evans when we won. I was always Jack Clark or John Burt, so, but he was always the one getting the goals with the ball. So it, it formed such an important part of our life. Uh, it was also, you're poor, therefore you get entertainment in other ways and enjoyment in other ways. And Australian Rules was, and the Essendon Football Club was such an important part of, of us growing up. It, but it was also the cauldron of hope. And you sit there and you think of your team, you bury for your team. 57 we lost and 59 we lost and and when we won in 62 and then won in 65, it sort of broke that pattern of sort of failure. It, it said that we could actually win. So it was more than football for me. It was, a, it was part of your life. It was ingrained in your psyche as you talked about football you played it, uh, you went to the game whenever you could, and uh, it was just an essential part of, of growing up in Brunswick, an essential part of our life. So, Bill, we, we then get to um, uh, university, and as you said, you got yourself through secondary school. You then were accepted to La Trobe University, and La Trobe University started to really shape your views on on what your life was going to look like and you had some very key relationships with a couple of uh, professors. I'm, I'm thinking there of Ross Martin. You want to talk to yeah, look, me I about think, what... I, you, I don't what think it shaped my life because I joined the Labor Party when I was 16 and I soon came to the view that if I was going to do anything politically, I'd, I'd want to work for the trade unions. I never wanted to go into Parliament and, and never, ever wanted to go into Parliament. So you'd made that call with so, as early as 15 or 16? Yeah, I was 16 in the Labor Party, and I reckon I would have made that call as 16 or 17 when I got to talk to trade unionists who were doing practical things. Uh, I, I thought the theory was not as good as the practice, and the practice was unionism. So rather than being in a theory of a, a Labor Party in, in Parliament, 
and, and remember, it was the 60s. And yeah, I was going to ask you that. So talk to me about that era. Talk to me about what the Australian worker looked like back in the 60s when you were making these decisions about the future. Well, you know, my own mother didn't get equal pay. My own mother got two-thirds of the pay and, and one-half of the pay of a cook. She was a cook working in hotels, so she would get uh, one-half of a chef's wage. So it was not equal pay. Uh, wage rates were relatively low in Australia. They were increasing. Uh, it was a 40-hour week, which wasn't too bad by international standards. Long service leave was uh, three weeks. Uh, so, so it's a paucity of conditions. Uh, and, and wage rates for, for women in particular were very, very low in, in that period. Uh, you couldn't go on strike because uh, there was bans clauses. Uh, so it's a lot of things happening in the 60s. So if, if you looked at the paper and you saw that the unions got long service leave or unions got a wage increase or Bob Hawke was there advocating for wage rates, you stuck pretty closely to them. And that's when I first met Bob Hawke, was actually in the, when I was about 18, uh, when he's advocating for wages. So I thought they were the champions of working people. So, so I'm going to get to Bob in a moment, but just rounding out La Trobe, was that well, a happy experience versus... No, 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 getting back to La Trobe, I'm just saying, I think I had my views set. Mm. Uh, I wanted to go to university um, because I thought this would give me the best opportunity to work for unions. And I wanted to do really well. And, and university was good for me. Whereas uh, high school was not... The teachers I, I just never related to and I, I did all the work by myself having all that behind you so when you went to universities being a self-starter and a self-learner gave you a great advantage you already went into university with a great advantage over most other students because you could actually work yourself and i had been doing that for the last two or three years so when I got to university the university environment for just learning was for me really good but then I, I did uh, I think fortuitously go to the right university because it's a small university just starting and you got the lecturer was also your tutor if you were smart. Mm. If you decided to opt for the late tutors, the, the late tutorials, and the lecturer was normally uh, the tutor giving you the tutorial as well. And as there I got to meet uh, uh, two people who were the great teachers in my life. Uh, one's Ross Martin and the other is Donald Whitehead. And and you stayed in contact with those two gentlemen for a while? Well, I stayed in contact with Ross Martin forever. He's still a friend. Still. He's over 90. So um, Donald Whitehead uh, died at a relatively early age in his late 40s. He was very sickly there. So uh, Donald Whitehead was actually uh, a supporter of the Liberal Party and gave advice mm. to the... Uh, Liberal government and employer organisation. Ross Martin's background was, he wrote about unions, so they came from different political perspectives. But Ross Martin was a pluralist and a Democrat, and Donald, Donald Whitehead was an historical thinker, and he, and he also taught you how to think. Uh, he got me aside one day and he said, you look, you, you're really committed, Bill, and I know you really work hard. I don't think anybody works as hard as you but you try to put too many ideas into into these essays with with they, they don't represent a cohesive whole a thought pattern he said if you've got a proposition then look at the various assumptions which underlie the prediction then then look at each assumption the effect so he gave me a style of thinking and a logical style of thinking uh, so that's why i thought in economic terms what's the proposition it's not absolute truth, it's not absolute lies, so what is the assumptions underpinning it? And you would progressively go through and think like that. So you started to become objective and have a much more scientific view of the way you approach answers and questions. So after that I did very well. In fact, I think I got top in every subject in economics. Yeah, no, my that. research tells me you did extremely well. So when you leave university and there was a time where you worked for, was it a tyre manufacturer or, or a no, tyres? Uh, before I went to university, I worked for uh, Dunlop Rubbers, a production yep. planner. That was before I went to university with Ian Dicker. 
Yeah, right, okay. Ian Ticker was in the so same So you did go back away with Ian, yeah. Yeah, I go back a long way with Ian Ticker. And was there some share trading in there that allowed you a, a couple uh, of wins uh, early? Oh, uh, yeah. I was... So you did embrace capitalism and what, what the market uh, forces... No, look, I was sitting there, but I wasn't going to do the honesty grow. I was going to uh, get a job, and I wanted to get a job for a union. I put in for the job at the ACTU, and the ACTU being what it was, very, very slow to react, that that uh, I had about six or seven weeks, and I noticed that uh, Woodside shares <laughs> uh, on every, every Tuesday morning, uh, they would go up waiting the announcement of Golden Beach 1A well, and then in the Tuesday afternoon they would go down. And I looked at this, I said, Jesus, this is a bloody <laughs> fairly regular pattern here. So I thought I'd go on, buy them on the Tuesday afternoon when it all collapsed, go down again. So I bought them Tuesday afternoon, then I would sell them, no matter what the outcome, what, what predicted outcome, I would sell them Tuesday morning when they'd gone up. And I did it, I did it eight or ten times, and I might took one thousand dollars, which is quite a lot of money, up to twenty three thousand dollars. So I was very successful <laughs> in a very short period of time. What'd you do with the money? I uh, bought a block of land. I bought a car. Uh, did a couple of other things with it. I think. No, oh, then I bought a house. So, Bill, you go into you go down the union path uh, after university, as you had been planning for several years. You you go to the Storm and Packers Union uh, before the ACT. Tell me a bit about the Storm and Packers Union, um, what it was back then, and uh, and the role that you played. Well, I went to work for the federal office. Uh, I went for the job at the ACTU, and Harold Souter said he wanted me to get the job. But Bob Hawke said that. Um, because I was still trying to do masters and avoiding the army, by, by avoiding conscription, um, I had to do some part-time work. But Bob said you can't work part-time work, so I didn't get the job. And but Jan Marsh might have been a better candidate anyway, but I didn't get the job. But I did get the job at the Storm and the Packers Union, which is in the same building as Ooh. the ACTU, because Harold Souter said to Jack Petrie, the person you should get is Bill. So I worked for them. And when I started there, I was 21. Um, Jack Peach had been there for a very long time. Uh, the job was pretty hard for him. So, so he started to spend more and more time overseas. Bill Landier was the State Secretary, really active and vital in trying to reju rejuvenate and revitalise the union. So I had this wonderful opportunity that f for the most part, I was the only person there with Pat Smith. We were actually running the federal office of the union and and being dragged along by the spirit of Bill Andy's capacity. So I learned very quickly. And it was, uh, you went from a position, you'd never been involved in an industrial dispute in your life, to in three years, we had 100 industrial disputes. You're always involved in industrial disputes, always involved in advocacy trying to do very practical things for working people. So, Bill, that sets us up now to go into one of the most important times um, for Australia, quite frankly, of the modern era, which was getting prepared for the, uh, the Hawke-Keating years um, and heading into when Hawke was to make his move in the 80s. Can you talk a little bit about... Um, the role you played at the ACT and when you started to get an inkling that the movement was in such a well-positioned place to, to have a real impact where you could get some very significant change through because it really, the, the moons were aligning, weren't they, through the latter part of the 70s and early 80s? Yeah, the, it, it was aligned, but we were very lucky too because there's a whole lot of set of circumstances. Um, the Whitlam government, Gough Whitlam, one of the great prime ministers of history, but we ended up with a rate of inflation of twice the rest of the world, whereas we had the source of the world's inflation, crude oil prices, were actually not increasing. So it took a special stupidity to create out of the economic circumstances of Australia of the early 70s 
a position where we had increasing inflation and consequently increasing unemployment. And the unions were part blamed for that because the wages strategy was incoherent, it was leapfrogging, and there wasn't any real commitment. And I, and I remember... So you, were you starting to form your view on the adjustments that need to be made in the economy to get to that equilibrium point, which we'll talk yeah, to? Yeah, we were... At a, at a ACG Congress in South Melbourne, Gough Whitlam walked in. This is his last speech to a union ever as Prime Minister. And people were booing and jeering him. By the time he got to the front, you know, the, the jeering had stopped. And like, like always, Gough Whitlam made it just a masterly speech, a masterly speech about society. And I was standing next to Laurie Carmichael, and bearing in mind at that time, the Labor government was saying that Laurie Carmichael was an evil force in, in our economy. Just describe for the list, listeners Laurie Carmichael. L- Laurie Carmichael was a Communist Party Assistant Secretary of the AEU. And he he leads all the industrial campaigns, and and I got to know him really well and worked with him on a whole lot of campaigns. So he said he there. He said, Bill, he deserved better than we gave him. And next time, Labor's in power, we'd need to make sure that what we do is lay the basis for permanent change, not short-term change. And from that point on, you you, you knew that if there was ever going to be another Labor government then you had his support, but you also had the support of people like Charlie Fitzgibbon, who created superannuation, who who I worked with, and Ray Geetzold, and Ivan Hodgson, and all these other union leaders. Uh, Jim Ma from the right wing and John Mines were able to harness them all together. So uh, we developed really good relationship with those senior union officials. Remember, I'm only 20... Uh, four or mm. 25, and 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 I went and talked to them all. You know, you go and talk to them every couple of weeks and you, or, or every month when they're about, and I got to be very close to Charlie Fitzgibbon. So uh, when I then went to the ACG, I had, I had as a young person better access to most union officials and probably anybody at that age in history. And like I had access to them all because so, I wasn't a communist, but... You know, I knew the right-wing leaders very well, and we came from a centre group, and we talked... So it, we developed an understanding. We, we were always talking about making society better, doing better things for people. And can you remember, Bill, um, Bob Hawke's reaction when the dismissal happened, where where Fraser becomes Prime Minister, Whit- Whitlam was dismissed? What was the... Because I've heard you talk before about... Well, Hawke basically created a strategy for the next, you know, effectively 15 years for the union movement and, and indeed the Labor Party well, around least, that time. At least for him for a very long time. Well, we sat there. He, he, I was working at the ACTU then as a research officer. I always talking to Bob and to Harold and Bob came back from Canberra and people were asking for, you know, demanding national disputes and this reaction and that reaction. He sat in his room, he said... Uh, well, we're not having national disputes. We're not having national strikes. Uh, Whitlam will lose. Uh, Malcolm Fraser will be paralysed as Prime Minister for what he did to the country. Therefore, he's not going to go after us as unions because he can't afford further to, div- to further divide the, the nation. And what we had to be was an organisation of compromise and consensus and we would fill this vacuum and he of course would lead it, the ACT would play the role. He said that will last for a few years until the electorate got re- gets rid of him, then I'll be the Prime Minister. So in that five minute uh, discussion he did outline our strategy, his own strategy to become Prime Minister and the Labor Party strategy because that's essentially what happened. And and he was brilliant, like he was, it was a brilliant exposition. Super smart Hawk, wasn't he? Uh, super smart, no, he was super smart, and and to, so tough, I mean, so tough. Now, the reason I think he quite liked me is that I would at least stand up to him, you know, we'd have some uh, hefty arguments. Once he said to me, he said, uh, and Sue was there, he said, uh, 
we had an argument about who should be the assistant secretary, and so it was a that was a pretty tough argument. Anyway, he said to me, "Move the car," and he threw his keys at me. And I didn't like him throwing the keys at me, so I picked up the keys, and I threw them back. And he, I broke his glass. He was drinking this beer, <laughs> and he, all the beer went over him. And Sue was amazed. I self, to be honest, so was I. Like I didn't mean it. It was so, but it was so. It was, it was like I'd done it a hundred times before. And he said, "Fuck, that was a good throw." <laughs> Was he Prime Minister at the time? No, no, he was President of the ACT. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he always quite liked uh, a bit of robust discussion. So where, what's, what's I mean, you, you had a very good vantage point for this. What's, what's Hawke's place in history? Oh, yeah. Look, Hawke, Hawke and Keating together, the great peacetime Prime Ministers of history. They're the, they're the people who made, made another country. Like... Roosevelt made another country for a long period. Actually, made another country, a better country, more caring country. You know, like and Hawke and Keating together, they made a better country, a more caring, committed, productive nation. Like history will judge, judge them both, and I, I always have trouble separating them. But just winning, and getting opportunity to govern for such a long time, like. Uh, they just, they just magnificent, and and history's only going to get better for them. You know, history's going to look back and say, uh, we got Medicare uh, in that period, but we didn't just get Medicare. So when Bob and I were sitting down trying to f- finalise the package, then Bob said, you have to have to agree to this wage reduction and have to agree to this levy. And I said, Bob, it's a bloody hard call, mate. Well, jeez. We've already given up. Said no, no. Our task here, Bill, is not just to get Medicare. That's done. Our task is to cement Medicare for the future generations. Now, if we can get a position where the employers no longer want private health care or want it as a corporate, then there'll be no there'll be no market for American style health care. Australians love Medicare, don't they? And, and that was right, but. Yeah. It's absolutely right, because I don't think there's been an employer ever since who's got up and said, oh, no, can we please have the American healthcare system? Because they have to pay for it over there. So I, don't, I think he was absolutely right. So, so when we walked away from those discussions, you did have the sense that this was something for 30, 50, perhaps 100 years in Australian society. This was one of the most important discussions. And, and Hawke was running the mm. argument. Not... Not that he was the owner of the idea, because he wasn't. You know, like Bill Haight owned the idea, and Gough Whitlam, and, uh, and Scott and Deagle. These other good, good people did a whole lot of work. But what he did, he owned the fight, and we were his army. So we were the army fighting for Medicare. So I'm going to talk about policy in a moment and some of the disputes you've been involved in, but I want to set the scene as far as the players. And the other big player here was Keating. Can you talk a bit about Keating, what he means to you, and maybe talk about Keating as Treasurer, Keating as Prime Minister? Well, well Bob, uh, Bob was plotting to undermine Bill Hayden and finally succeeded. Before that happened, Hayden said, well, he's going to stop Bob by removing one of Bob's lieutenants, uh, Ralph Willis and put Keating in. So I don't know, I once had a conversation with Keating before that, and I thought, he's, he's an arrogant arsehole, this bloke. Knows everything, what has no this? commitment. So I said, oh, well, you know, this, this bloke, this bloke is actually no good. When uh, Bob gets to be the leader, he said, I'm not changing. You're going to have to learn to live with Keating. I said, mate, that's not, that's terrible. I mean, here we are. We've, we've, we've gone out there, we've supported you, we've helped convince John Button to be, uh, uh, to change his vote, we've got, we're championing for you, and what you come back and, you, and you're going to give us this bloke. And well, the first time we really get, get to see Keating, Keating wanders in to the Waterside Workers boardroom in Sydney. What year is this, Bill? This is 1982. Right. Nine in late eighty two, early eighty three. I think it might have been 
very early 83. He, he wanders in and here we are, got Charlie Fitzgibbon, uh, Simon Crone, I think, is there. Uh, Cliff Dolan is there. And me, we're all there. Now, we're, we're dressed like we're just out of the local Jimmy store or the Opportunity Shops up in Sydney. So we're, he walks in and he, he, like he's got this suit on. He looks like he's just fresh, like a male model, <laughs> jumped off the plane. He's only there five minutes or so telling us what to do. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. So we said, look, mate, you're, you're an arsehole. <laughs> you are an arsehole. Look, here we are. He said, I don't support the court. I'm just going through the mechanics of it. I don't support it. Don't support it at all. So, well, we don't support you either. So, but anyway, he's talking, we've got a wage claim we're making for a, uh, uh, to catch up on the lost wage increases. And Cliff Dolan is a very nice man, but not a great negotiator. Cliff Dolan says to Cutting, oh, well, you know, all these things can't be done straight away. We understand that. We'll do it over time. Cutting, we'll do it over time. He didn't even wait for, He didn't even wait five seconds for any of us to say that might not be an acceptable. Not even five seconds. He says, so I agree with you, Cliff. We'll do it over time, and we're happy to write that in. And Charlie Fitzgibbon is sitting next to me. He this bloke's really smart, mate. So just uh, Charlie He's, Fitzgibbon. Charlie Fitzgibbon says, this bloke is really smart. <laughs> We've got to watch him. <laughs> anyway, we... Uh, he rings me up after the uh, first day of the Labor Party's won. He says, the Treasury say we've got to devalue. We said, we thought they'd have to devalue. It's not a problem. He said, but he said that the unions won't accept it. I said, they're not stupid, mate. It'll be fine. Skip the devalue. We won't go for the wage increase. We're fine, mate. Just trust us. Learn to trust us. Anyway, he said, oh, no, I don't know about that. So anyway, he learned to trust us. And progressively, you know, we've got a good relationship. We he introduced these tax changes for super. He didn't talk to us. He didn't talk. He didn't talk to anybody. He didn't. But he's changing the tax system. Now it was a very preferential tax system. It was effectively sixty percent of your marginal uh, tax rate. So, uh, so effectively, it was marginal tax rate was sixty percent. You paid three percent. So on super, so it was very, very preferred. But he introduced me. Introduced, he didn't talk to us, so we had, had an argument with him, and we're fighting him, and, it, and, and we finally agreed to a good package, a reasonable package. And Charlie Fitzgibbon, who was leading the discussions with us, for us, uh, said as we walked out of this meeting, he said, that bloke's brilliant. What you've got to do, Bill, is you've got to stick very close to him. <laughs> stick close to Keating. So don't worry about the others. Stick close to Keating. Because he's 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 really smart. Now that was Charlie Fitzgibbon's last public involvement. So I did stick next to very close to Keating. One of the great yeah. partnerships was born. And he's one of the great leaders of all time. I mean, mm-hmm. he said at that meeting, if you want to ever do anything on for superannuation for everybody, you can't have this tax system. I'm only cleaning the decks for you. I'm cleaning the decks for us to do something significant. It's like, like somebody saying they've punched you in the face for your own good. Like, uh, yeah, we're going to punch you up just for your own good to teach you something. I said, oh, well, I'm uh, not sure about that. But we did. it was the first time we'd heard anybody say they to have national superannuation as part of their philosophy. So it was a very important meeting and a very important relationship uh, with Keating. It, and when... Are you prepared to tell us about the Kirribilli Agreement? Is that was that? Yeah, I've said it before. It's not uh... <laughs> so. Set the scene for us. So Keating's starting to get um, agitated. Keating's getting agitated. Hawke's getting uh, distracted. The government's you're facing all these economic problems. Uh, Peter Abel's not sat on the Reserve Bank. I, I knew Peter really well because I did the negotiations in the airline. He ran. Uh, uh, Amsterdam Lines, and he was also chief executive of TNT. So they were very important. He's a very important political player in the, the economics of wage adjustments, because there's two industries that are very important. And, and the ACTU did the negotiations in those areas, along with others. But we were the key in in most of the most of the 80s in those areas. So we we're sitting at the Reserve Bank one day, 
You know, I said, this is pathetic. You know, Keating is pathetic. And, and Bob's pathetic. I mean, this, this country all these changes. So, so I said, we've got to go and see them. So Abel said, I'll organise to see them. So you know, I'd been talking to Paul. So Bob, he said, oh, well, Bob's going to organise a meeting. I said, fine. So we finally, he, he organised one meeting, didn't, didn't occur. Then um, Peter Abel said, look, I think you should have the meeting. So we had the meeting. And uh, Bob, so just, Bob just walked in and said, well, I've considered it. And after the next election, I'm happy to pass it over. That was more or less it. And so is anything, had, is anything written down or is it no, just... No, no, we had a cup yeah. of tea. I had a really nice... Peter Abel's had a nice cup of tea and I had a nice cup of tea and it was... That was it. And I don't think anybody said much and went outside. It was raining and waited for the... Um, waited for the um, taxi. Taxi didn't come, so Peter Abel said, I'll drive you back to the hotel. And Peter Abel was perhaps the worst driver <laughs> who's ever got a licence in Australia. He kept on hitting the edge of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. This, we kept on hitting the edge of it with the... I said, Peter, you keep on hitting the edge, mate. Well, you're going to kill us. I oh, said, I just got back from overseas. And I'm trying to accommodate the different side of the road. So I reckon he hit it about six times before he got back to the hotel. So, Bill, that, that, that's got to be a difficult position for you to be in in the months ahead because you're close to both Hawke and Keating. How did you navigate your relationship, both the friendship and the look, I professional? I, look, I don't, I don't think it was difficult because, the, the, look, if Bob had said he's not making a commitment, then Paul, I think, would have left because Paul would have other things to do. Um, Bob gave the commitment and Paul stayed. Uh, what you wanted was to win the next election. I mean, doing big changes in the middle of a whole lot of things... Yeah, you, you do need continuity of government, continuity of delivery. It's, it's, have you ever tried to do that Rubik's Cube? You know, it's bloody, bloody hard. So the only way I could do the Rubik's Cube is to get the book and learn how to all get the moves to get the answer at the end. You, tr you knew what the answer was. You knew we want a national health care and national superannuation and national minimum wage rates. and You knew the answer. But you had to get there in a very difficult way. Something a very difficult way for it to explain. So you needed a continuity of leadership. And if Hawke had made a commitment uh, to stay and work on it, then we could have lived with that. But he, he, he wasn't making the commitment to work to do all of those things, whereas Keating, he had subcontracted his job in that respect to Keating, and Keating was doing it all. As far as we were concerned, all those key things. Yeah. Not that Bob wasn't no, doing other sense. things. Mm. He, w he was doing, establishing those relationships and he was establishing the objective. The objective was very simple, remember. It wasn't hard. The objectives were pretty simple. That is, you want national health care, you want national minimum wages, you want uh, national superannuation, you want more money spent in education and you had to grow the economy. In order to grow the economy, you had to deregulate it and make it more competitive and effective. So the idea itself, the philosophy, wasn't some very, very complex propositions, but implementing them was very difficult. Mm. Bill, and we'll, we'll come back to that era, but I think it was important to set the stage as to who was there and your relationships. Talk to me about the art of the dispute. And if we're, everybody I speak to... Bill Kelty is known as a, a brilliant tactician, a strategist that was able to read the play and almost read the play four or five steps ahead. And there was a lot of very um, famous disputes in your lifetime when you had a seat at the table. There was the pilot's dispute, nurse's dispute. Obviously, the waterfront came later, but talk to me about the art of the dispute and, and what ultimately you're trying to get for your constituents. Well, I think we're involved in a lot of disputes, not just not re uh, causing disputes. So the first thing you had to do as a union official, you had to say, what is it you want to win? So do you want a wage increase? Do you want a superannuation, long service leave? What are the things that you want to win? And in order to get that view, you've got to go and talk to the members. So we used to go and talk to the members. 
And you say, what are your claims? They give you a claim of 48 things they wanted. So I would take it up and rip up half, then I'd rip it up again. So I'm not interested in 44 of these things. Are no interest to me, you know, increasing meal, meal, meal allowance by four cents. And who cares, you know? Are we going for hours, reduced hours or long service life? So be very clear as to what you want. Then get members to understand it. Then get sufficient evidence so that you're persuasive with employers. That when you sit down and put your case, you're advocating a position based on knowledge or fact and you're capable of arguing a point. And before you do that, make sure you understand their perspective. So before we got involved in any leading an industrial dispute, we would sit down and say, if I was the employer, I would have the following objections. If I was employed, this is what... You try to understand their point of view. And you would offer a reasoned, peaceful satisfaction to your claims with membership support. If they know they negotiated with us, the members would support it. So we were an honest agent. So you offered them that, but if they didn't like that, you would offer them buggery. That is, you don't like the claim, therefore we will take the following action and we will hurt you. So you've got a choice of a reason, rational, kind approach, or you know you're dealing with people who are really tough and not prepared to have a fight. And to be honest, we like the fighting more than we like the argument. The fighting was always good fun, I've got to tell you. When the employer said, no, we don't, I said, fantastic. You go back and say, this is really good. This is going to be really good. This is going to be... They have never known what sheer buggery is like, <laughs> but we will give them sheer buggery. But when, when did you feel most satisfied? Because I know that you had the employers in mind as well. When did you feel most satisfied that a win was a win and... Well, most for, uh, most employers with whom you, you, you like you negotiate with Ted Harris in the oil industry said no more disputes, but we'll just settle. Just oh, you say, well, you tell us, Ted, what's reasonable. I'll tell you what I think is reasonable. We'll talk to the workers. And I don't think we ever had a dispute up until the dispute that the government imposed upon the oil industry. We never had a dispute after that because it's just straightforward. We never had a dispute with Peter Abel's the transport industry, but Abel's just say, well, this is. The only thing with Peter, you'd have to give him a half a percent or one percent. You'd have to say, we want seven percent. He'd say, no, 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 it's green to seven. Well, what about six, Peter? Well, six is okay. So you always had to give him a percent. But you, we never have really had a major dispute with, with a whole lot of employers because they actually thought, like, they're bastards, really. But they're likeable bastards. And the thing about them is that they're very effective. That is, whatever they tell you, they deliver. So, and Simon Crean, you know, Simon Crean was like that too. So we actually had more industrial disputes, led more industrial disputes in the 70s and early 80s than just about any unionist in history. And we had really big disputes. Now, the, you know, the two one, the three disputes we had, Medicare, we stopped Australia. You couldn't get, you couldn't get move in Australia. We stopped Australia. Now we sat down and worked out the means by which you can stop a nation without calling everybody out on strike. So we worked that all out, and we had disputes over Nelson Mandela and disputes over French nuclear testing. And, and you've never seen a Charlie Fitzgibbon who, or a Pat Garrity and, and others work out the economics of causing disruption in the logistic train chain like them they were just geniuses mate they made us look like <laughs> they made us look like amateurs they could plot out you know this this boat this vessel's coming from south africa it's going to sri lanka it's going to land here it's going to change its name and it's going to change all its inventory it's going to ca land in sydney at this name and so we would know when the boat arrived where the goods came from and what we would do is the seamen's union would stop it They'd say, we're not sure whether you come from South Africa, but we think you do. Stop it for a week. They'd say, oh, well, we don't know. Have to go into the wharfs. Charlie, they would say, oh, I'm not sure where you come from. We think you might come from South Africa. Stop them for another week. 
they get their their goods unloaded. We say, where do, what factories do they go to? Went to these factories. We go out. These goods might come from South Africa. So we stop them. So we just create a sheer buggery <laughs> in, in support of Nelson Mandela. We were the most effective. And I think he said we were the most effective in the world in terms of... And Hawke was right behind it too. And Hawke was right behind it. Mm. And it was a broke every law. We broke every law. People were threatening us. They come and sue us. They'd, you know, you said people come in and say, here's, your, here's this legal action. You say, oh, that's fine. <laughs> what will I do with this? You've got to run. It's no purpose giving, because we haven't got any money. So what are you going to sue us? The union's got no money. We've got no money. What's the purpose of suing us? So we really loved it. I mean, we, we did have enjoyment out of it. So I've got to tell what, you. What was your relationship with the commission like? Good and bad and terrible, all of, all of them at all times. Because <laughs> yeah. there was a famous time when uh, you're in the commission and the BLF basically came in and raided the commission, didn't they? And you'd... Tell me what happened then, because that was Well, we had a national wage a case, a national wage case. We'd reached agreement with the government about the wage claim. Uh, I was thinking, John Halfpenny here in Victoria and uh, some of the BLF people, they'd organised a protest. They're supposed to be protesting against the delays, they're supposed to be protesting for us. That's what they're supposed to do. They're, they're supposed to be protesting in support of our claim. But they get that they weren't protesting against uh, the Commission delaying it. And they weren't protesting for our claim, they're just protesting against us. So they'll start to yell at us. Like you all got in the Commission and nobody yelling and screaming. and <laughs> But they're, they're yelling and screaming at us. Me in particular. So we had to stop what it. Yelling, what were they yelling at you? Oh, sell out, you know, 3% is not enough, we won 8 or something, you know. You know, start chanting and yelling, so we uh, we stopped the commission, stopped the proceedings, we went and talked to them. You always go, in any fight, never go for the weakest, always go for the strongest. Always go for the person who's got the loudest voice presenting the greatest problem and go straight for them. Get everybody aside and go straight for them and straight up to them and say, you're actually doing us a lot of harm. If you want to continue to do us a lot of harm, then we will do you a lot of harm. Well, let's have a real fight, mate. And if you think you can beat us, you've got to remember we have a lot of good friends. I had good friends and the ship painters and dockers, the stormmen and packers. We had really good friends, mate. Nobody could beat us in a fight, I've got to tell you. Not that I could, but no, none of our people... You took them outside, though, didn't you? No, we took them on our side. <laughs> we took them on our side and they, they drifted away. <laughs> drifted away. That was, that was good. So why I ask you about the commission, because there was a famous time, I think you'd come back from London... And there was something that the Commission wage case came out not really where you were looking for it to, to land. And there was a very famous quote about you saying, just because the Commission um, throws up a lot of vomit like it has, it doesn't mean we have to lick it up like a dog. I think that was the quote. Oh, it's not a quote that I remember. Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, you remember the quote? No, I do remember it. No, of course I remember the quote and I remember... I remember the case. Uh, we were having lots of arguments. Just as we were restructuring the award system and they were having fights about who's getting what, including the commission salaries, and there were uh, perhaps legitimate disagreements between where we were heading. We were heading to a simpler minimum yeah. rate system with bargaining on top. They didn't necessarily believe that. So there's, perhaps there's an intellectual argument as well as other personal arguments. Uh, in any event, I said to Keating before the case, they're going to knock us off. And in return for that curtain, we're going to legislate for super. Not go through the award system, but legislate for its super. And then if they didn't persist, they didn't develop our model of bargaining and minimum rates, then we'd actually legislate for that. So, so in that fight, I had the great advantage. I knew that's not a fight we could lose. But I had to make sure that there was not the slightest doubt that we were in for the fight. And that was uh, perhaps an overstatement, but it, 
It, it was. It got the message. Well, it got the message, and you know, like Barry Man is a really nice person, and he was he was sick. He was sick, and he, he subsequently died not long thereafter. And perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I wouldn't say it today. And uh, knowing Barry Man and the legacy would, because it, it's associated with that fight, and he deserved better than that, better than what I was giving him there, because he's a much better person. It was never about him, it was about the system and it became personalised mm. and and perhaps, you know, I went too hard. I honestly think I perhaps went too hard. I'd already said no. I'd already said the unions will not accept this decision. I'd already said enough. I don't think that was, I think, uh, that was a bit of a smart-ass comment, which perhaps I didn't really need to make. So, Bill, um, I want to talk to you now about uh, going to actually go back to <coughs> how we started the podcast when we talked about those safety nets. And there was a visit, I think, by Tony Blair and his chief of staff. I think it was even before he was prime minister. And he, he talked about the third way. And I think you said at the time, Australia's sort of already had the third way. It's had it since the turn of the century. When well, we're, we're up at Kirribilli House with... Uh Paul Keeney and we listened to Tony Blair and Tony Blair a very nice person and he, he was you know good looking and and very persuasive and he was he was here to look at the system but he talked about the third way and you know the third way the third way and the third way he kept on talking about it and Paul Keating after about an hour which is pretty hard for him we sat there Paul and he says look I know we rude Tony but Australia went the third way in the 1890s mate he said I you know really what are you about and sort of tony blair said well we're going the third way yeah but paul said well we are the third way aren't we, aren't we bill I said, yeah i think we're the third way already tony like we we are the third way we're not communists we're not market people we're in the middle we want national health care national superannuation national wages investment in education but you've got to meet the market you've got to make the economy work to produce the capacity that's the third way that's us that's why we're friendly with a lot of employers and that's why we're friendly with the communists. And he said, you're not friends with the communists. They're your greatest supporters. He said, how can the communists support you? He said, they're the communists. I said, because they believe in national health care. They believe in national superannuation. They believe in decent wage rates. Why wouldn't they support us? Oh, I said, not the communists in, in the Labor Party in uh, England. They don't support it. He said, you have to fight them. I said, well, we're not fighting them. They're our friends. So I think he... he you thought we were very strange people. So if you look back, and, and, and this is where I sort of wanted to go around your philosophies, which I've come to, to know and love around the approach to modernising and adjusting an economy and getting to that point of equilibrium with some of those key policy decisions that you made back in the 80s and 90s. Do you feel like it was all a success or was the stuff that you should have done better or... If you look back now, are you you're proud of what was created? Oh, I'm proud of what we created. It's not me. I mean, I've never said it's me, and it's ne never me. We were very lucky we just had this tremendous group of union officials that we could rely upon. And we're very lucky we had Hawke and Keating and Ralph Willis and really good people in the Labor Party. Simon Crane. And Simon Crane. And, and Simon was in both sections for us. I mean, we're just very lucky. And and to personalise it is to trivialise it, really. We were just lucky. We had all committed to the same things and take the same opportunity. And we were lucky, in a strange sense, we had the experience of stuffing up the Whitlam government because at least it gave us a, a, a book on what not to do. So we were very fortunate to have all of those things going. And, and communism had collapsed, you see. Communism had collapsing in the 80s. So if you're a member of the Communist Party all your life and you can hardly say, let's point to the Soviet Union as an economic... Uh, Icon, you see, the, the bloody places, ratbag places, it's falling apart, mate. That's not, so we were able to recruit those people to achievement, or most of them to achievement. So we were very lucky. So are you proud? I'm proud that the country is better, you know. Like, I'm proud that we have a, a fantastic healthcare system and, and high minimum wages. And I'm proud we've got a good super, and I'm proud that people got better education. Is it, is it personal? It's not personal. It's, we, we would go to meetings of union officials and unionists 
Thousands, not just a handful, thousands of people. And 10,000 people or 8,000 people in Festival Hall. And we would say, we, ha we think, strategically, we have to support a wage offset for Medicare. Nobody would vote against it because they all wanted Medicare for themselves and their children. So I was a great supporter of working people. And, and I, cause I, I was motivated to represent them but I was motivated most of all by them. Because mm. I don't know how many times we got written off. We got written off all the time. You won't get health care, you won't get superannuation, you won't get the minimum. We got written off all the time. We were never going to win any of these things, remember, in the 70s. We weren't going to win any of those things, and we won them all. And we won them all because we could, you could go to working people, you would explain to them that this is better for them, and, and they would listen to you. And if they believed that you had to fight for it, then they would give you the most important thing, they gave you the liberty to fight for them. Which one's your favourite? Is it compulsory superannuation? Is it the Accord? Medicare? Which, which one do you think had a real, like they all had a huge impact, but which one do you think the will one that ultimately I, have the best impact for Australia <laughs> over years to come? Look, I, don't, I think they're all important. The, the thing that I've got the most personal pleasure from. It's not that we were the cat, not because it was our idea. It wasn't our idea in national health care. But when you've had two national disputes, and when you get editorial writers hop into the ACQ and said that, you know, we're, we're industrially uh, lunatic, and, and when you've got employers who campaign against you that you're using political disputes, and, and where you got where we could have gone to with health care, like, we would have won health care for most corporates that were unionised. In fact, Malcolm Fraser said at a meeting with Charlie Fitzgibbon, after the national disputes, these, these are enormous disputes, but after the national disputes, uh, Malcolm Fraser says to Charlie Fitzgibbon, he said, what I can't understand is why you would have been involved in a national dispute when you can probably negotiate health care for your own members. Charlie said, of course I can negotiate health care for our own members. It took me one week to get to health care for our own workers. But we don't want health care for waterside workers. We want national health care. And we could have easily gone that route. Mm. But we chose not to. We chose to get a national health care system. And not only just choose to put it up in an, in an artificial way, fight for it. Like, we really fought for it. We were, we, were, we were the army fighting it, and that's the way you approached it. We were going to get national health care for everybody, or we weren't going to survive. So we, we just went for it. And, and when you see that level of criticism and the, and, the, and the weight that so many workers placed upon your judgment, not my personal judgment, but our collective judgment being right, I go to go to oil industry workers who we, we negotiated the health care for and say, if we get national health care, you have to give up corporate health care. This was in 1982. And after we won, you had to go back to the same workers and say, we're giving up corporate health care for national health care. And 85 or 90% of those oil workers voted for it. Like, that's, you just, the goodwill you get and the, and the, the sense of, what makes good people? Mm. These are working class people fighting for something. They've won it and they're giving it up in the national's interest. This is just wonderful. So when we walked out that day and we signed up to the deductions and signed up to, and, and Bob said, that's it, mate. Like, we've, we, we've won. We've won national health care. It was, you just weren't so happy. You know, you were so happy. Uh, super. Uh, nobody thought we were going to get national health care. No, nobody thought we were going to get national super. They thought it was all pious nonsense that we couldn't extract, but we did. But the pleasure of that was over a long, long period. The pleasure for n national superannuation is now when you pick up uh, Australian super gets 20.5% return and there's four or 500,000 in the balances and it and Australian super members, 96%, say they're a fantastic organisation. And do they want, they actually want to save more. 
the satisfaction you get with superannuation over a long period of time. The wage rates, well, it was, uh, you know, Stein and Packers were getting paid forty dollars a week, nineteen seventy. Women who were doing the job of storing and packing were getting paid seventy-five cents an hour. You know, we we fought for equal pay, and we fought for higher minimum wages. So. Relative satisfaction, if you ask me for a minute, the, the time you get the absolute joy, you know, just sheer joy, there's nothing but national, nothing beats Medicare. Nothing beats it. You know, but you ask me... I thought you'd say super, but... No, no, I think just super... Super is a great economic instrument. Mm. But it's, 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 it's enjoyment has been over a much longer period. Bill, I'd like to ask you now about your great friendship with Lindsay Fox and the and the Fox family. It it's been an enduring partnership for many many years. Uh, wonderful partnership. Uh, you complement each other very well. Do you want to talk a bit about Lindsay and what he means to you? Sure. Uh, my mother and I had one different view about employers. She said you can't find good employers in the country. I said. The whole political strategy of some of the social democrats in the past is actually to use the good employers as a beacon. They make them the target, and there are good employers who, who do not have substantially different philosophical position than us. That is, they still want to employ people, pay decent wage rates, provide safe conditions for them, and, and care for them. Now, that's not an argument that always goes well in the trade union movement, but it's an argument that I always ran and believed in. Uh, so when you got to meet people like uh, Peter Abels and Gary Pembert and your dad and other people, uh, there was people that you actually felt you might be right because sitting down, there wasn't a lot of difference. Um, and when I met uh, Lindsay, Lindsay came in one day and he, he said that he didn't want the settlement that we'd negotiated with Peter Abels and Gary Pemberton, who was main um, Brambles and TNT, the TNT. biggest transport companies. And I said to Lindsay, mate, look, I don't really know you. Peter Abels said I should talk to you, but we've done a deal. A deal is a deal, that's it. You do one deal, you don't do a whole lot of deals. I've done that agreement, that's it. He said, you're not interested in our views. I said, of course I'm interested in your views. You know, but the answer is no. I've got to tell you, no, you do a deal, you, that's it, you stick to deals. And I, I, I'm not going to change it for you. I wouldn't change it for me, my mother, let alone you. So you were you, you so, a bit unhappy. But then he walked out and he came back. Only a minute. He said, you know what, you're absolutely right. You don't change deals, do you? I said, no. And from that point on, we, we developed a good relationship and uh, it got better and better. And when his son committed suicide, Lindsay and I, we went around the country uh, together on the jobs, getting jobs for people. And Lindsay was just fantastic. In the end, we didn't disagree on anything of substance. He wanted a Medicare system. He wanted decent minimum wages. But he wanted jobs. So you could say, in this country that we've produced, there are people whom you relate to but the argument, however, was very important. So when people said to me, you know, I should go into Parliament, I said, I'm never going to Parliament. I'm never going to Parliament. I wasn't going to work in the super funds. I didn't have too many options other than writing books, which I could struggle to do, or working with Lindsay and other key people who I, who I liked, who happened to be employers. So I was the one union official who went and worked with Lindsay and others. Now, others have, have done it, of course, but, but I did it as a conscious decision to say that I think you can work with employers and I think you can work with people like Lindsay and you can make society better because the only organisations making societies better are not just unions. Your dad made society better at the AFL. Lindsay made it better in the transport industry. You work with people in a productive sense. Now that I think is the third tier of the strategy which I referred to before. That's 
and it should be part of the DNA of the Labor Party. Unashamedly, it should be part of what we stand for, an ability to work constructively with companies, good companies and good leaders. And that's why Bob Hawke had such a great relationship with a whole lot of business leaders. And that's why I think the most effective transform agent for business in this country was actually Paul Keating, because he did understand how business works. If you don't understand how business works, then, then you don't understand how wealth is created. If you don't understand how wealth is created, then, then you can't argue effectively for its distribution. You must create the wealth to distribute it effectively. So I always thought it was an entirely consistent thing to work with Lindsay, for me to work with Lindsay, doing the things that I believed in. I've never walked away from my belief in unionism or those big safety nets, not from a second, not for a, a second of my life. But I've never thought I've done anything other than be working with the good Australians to make society better. Of which Lindsay, Lindsay Fox is one of the most very special people. And so was your dad, you know. I know it's personal, but your dad, there was never any, there was no ideological dissent about improving the position for players. No ideological dissent about making the healthcare system. This was not a matter of difference. There was no difference between us. And it made the country stronger, and it does make the country stronger, if you can get, the, get that level, level of, of understanding across a whole range of groups. A whole range of groups. Mm. And Lindsay was, is, was, was and is wonderful to me. And, you know, I think I've, I've not been a bad director for him. I think I've given him some pretty good advice, and we've worked together uh, really well. But I think if you want a more mature country, you've got to have a mature attitude to employers, and employers have got to have a mature attitude to unions and other groups. And Lindsay, I think, personifies that. He is truly a great Australian. We've done a, re a remarkable number of things. When we did the job plan, we sat down with the department, they told us all the things we couldn't do. We couldn't do this, we couldn't do that. So Lindsay got very irate. So I rang up Keating and I said, oh, we just met with 30 bureaucrats who told us all the things we can't do. So I said to Paul, what is it we can do? He said, you just do what you want to do. <laughs> Let me know. And that's why we approached it. In the end, there wouldn't have been one person in Australia who said we'd get 50,000 trainees. You wouldn't have found one person prepared to put their hand up and say they, they could do this. But we did it, and the catalyst for really doing it was Lindsay. It was just, like, just wonderful How leadership. long did it take? You went to how so many years? Seven years, or six seven or seven years. years. Yeah, amazing. So we did it. And your dad's like that too. You know, you, go, you can look back. He transformed uh, the AFL. He made companies better. It was never on the short end of trying to get the cheapest way to do things. He was always committed. He was one of the people, spotless, said, we're, our hands up for the national health care. We're not into the other stuff. So your dad was part of that group too. You know, that's why we're friends. You know, that's why we are genuinely friends. That's why genuinely friendship with your dad, genuine friendship with you, genuine friendship with Lindsay, because it's real. Not that you can't have differences of view, I'm sure we do, but it's genuine because your purposes were, n were not different might do it different ways we may see different things and uh, but but I think that sense of if there's one thing missing in Australia at least in the Labor Party it was was there's not sufficient strength to say that it's not all a contest because uh, I said I don't know any employers I don't know any employers who uh, oppose Medicare and I'll just f finish on this argument I was coming back from, from where, in Washington with Simon Crew and David Weed, and we're going to Austin to meet Lindsay and and uh, Andrew Peacock, who's living in Austin. Now I got on a plane uh, with a professor of chemistry from one of the universities in in Washington. So we are after the long flight, after we started to chat. And he said, you know, obviously from Australia, he said, yes. And so we talked about politics. 
and he was a right wing warrior. He was truly right wing. So we talked, we talked about Australia, and he said, uh, "You have national health care. You have socialised health care." No, I said, "We have national health care. It's national health care covering everybody. There's private insurance called national health care, not socialised health care. National health care. We'll call, we call it. Oh, was we call it socialised health care?" And he said, what about wages? I said, our wages, this was a few years ago, it was $14 an hour. He said, $14 an hour? He said, our minimum wages is $4 an hour, $6. So you're three times as much. I said, yeah, three times as much. He said, well, your unemployment rate must be very high. I said, no, it's low. It's much lower than the United States at that point. Just marginally lower. Participation rate's higher. He said, that's hard to believe. He said, uh, and we have national superannuation. He, got, he said... I've never thought that I could spend so much time sitting next to a communist. He said, I'm going to get home, tell my wife, I spent a whole flight next to a communist. I said, I'm oh, not going to. I said, he said, what about gun laws? I said, this will surprise you. He said, the Prime Minister of Australia, who was conservative, introduced really tough gun laws. He said, you must be joking now. He said, you must be joking. He said, the, the, the Conservative Prime Minister introduced really, I said he did, introduced really tough gun laws. Because we think guns are for shooting animals, not shooting people. That, did, that upset him a bit, but anyway. He said, and who are you saying? I said, I'm saying uh, Andrew Peacock, who was the leader of the opposition. So he's a socialist. I said, no, he's not a socialist. He's a cons- leader of the Conservative Party, but didn't win. And Lindsay Fox. He said, what's he? He said, I said, he is a head of a big Australian trucking company, Australia's largest owned trucking company. He said, don't tell me he's a communist too. I said, no, no, he's not a communist, but he does believe in national health care and super. And when I got off the plane, he said, he came back to me, he said, I really enjoyed that conversation. He said, I don't think it'll work here, but I really didn't enjoy it. And I think Lindsay is part of that system. Your dad was part of it. You know, when you, when you try to interlock a nation, and you have to have things m- meld together. Yeah. Lindsay's one of the great melders in Australia's history. One of the great people who can actually meld and make a nation by fitting all the pieces together. Uh, Lindsay's one of those people. Just a marvel. No, I, I absolutely agree, Bill, and the lovely words. And your dad, your dad was the same, you know. You know, you, you live with your dad. Did did? You, no, no, you live with your dad. Did your dad ever say once that he didn't believe in national health care? No, he was never. a great supporter of it. Did he ever come to and say, oh, no, we're paying our people, the minimum wage is $12, which is too, 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 too high, we've got to reduce it to five? Did you ever, come out, did you ever have a conversation around your, your table about superannuation only being available to a handful of people? No, because I think the employers at the time, they came around, they saw it. You know, it was it was argued well. It was debated. It was the benefits were were actually acknowledged, and it became yeah. But they didn't fight for it. You know, not they're not ideologues. Like some of the people in America, they're actually ideologues. National health care is so, so wrong in their mind. Mm. Well, hence some of the disputes, which got pretty ugly. Yeah. Oh, they did get ugly. But Jim, you know, I'm just saying, it's more it's more than just a handful of people. Just quickly on the AFL, did you like the AFL? Your time on the commission? Oh, I think it's good and bad. Uh, people say, did you like being on the Reserve Bank? I said, no, not really, because you go in there and it's really hard. Because you take the job really seriously. Australia's got high levels of inflation. We've got to change it. Uh, we, we know we've kept the interest rates up too high for too long in a short-term time, but we're then going to make a much bigger decision to say, well, probably we've heard, so let's, but at least make the error worthwhile. At least, this time, get inflation down and out. And so we had to live through that and consequently live with high levels of unemployment that would have otherwise been the case, I think. Uh, but it was very serious. Like, it was really serious. It was a very important body. And do you get a lot of pleasure out of it? Well, you get, you get, you get a sense of satisfaction, but not pleasure. When your dad convinced me to go onto the commission, I loved AFL footy, but most of all, I loved Essendon Footy Club. But the day you walk into the commission, 
is a day that you take on a bigger responsibility. You, it, it, you, you, you've got to be very careful because you don't want that love of the game or love of players to overwhelm you. What you've got to do is make or be party to making decisions for the future for footy. And that's a, that's a very big responsibility. It's not as big as the Reserve Bank in economic terms. It's not as big as the wages in wages terms or healthcare, healthcare terms. But for a lot of people, it's a very important part of their life. So I took it really seriously. You know, you, I took the AFL really seriously. And, uh, you know, we were trying to change an organisation. Your dad was leading this with, with Colin Carter in particular. They were leading this, and Graham Samuel in part, but they were trying to change an organisation into a professional organisation and a game into a professional co and get for it the economic wherewithal into the future. This was at the cusp of the professionalisation, not just of the players, but of the whole game. And it was very, very like it was exciting to be involved, but it was hard work. And you knew some of the decisions weren't easy decisions. But but your dad led it, and I more or less followed your dad and Ian Collins, and I had a specific role. You know, I wasn't... It was not like the unions. When you go in and you, you represent uh, all the unions, it wasn't like you're negotiating with employers. Uh, you'd have leaders, and your role was to play a role. And your dad led it. And your, da your dad led this professionalisation in a very effective way. My job was to support your dad when necessary. Now, because I could be a bit ruder than most and a bit tougher than most, and your dad was very pleasant, he's a very nice person, your dad, occasionally he would get you a note and say, Bill, it's time to say no. So you'd say to, them, say to these people, you know what your trouble is? You think Channel 7 run the game and you think we owe you something the reality is this we owe you nothing we owe you nothing you've lived off the game for too long the players aren't getting enough money we're not getting enough money and we want more so if you had to say it you had to say it so that was the role you would have to play so that's the role i did play obviously which I quite enjoyed, didn't mind doing it, because you had to change the game. You had to say, we're now at this stadium, the MCG, one of the great stadiums of the world. Yeah, for but the listeners, we're, we're holding this podcast overlooking the an empty MCG stadium, which has been a nice backdrop for this afternoon. Yeah, yeah but they think they owned, They think, thought they owned the game of AFL footy. Mm. They thought they owned it. They don't, you, you come here. Not that I ever got invited a lot, but, but occasionally they would talk to you when they... It would tell you all these things they're doing. You say, but AFL supporters paying for this. Not cricket supporters, AFL. It's a club's paying for this. And, and you don't get any money without them. You can't build these things without AFL. So we want a bit more respect. And when they say, said, I'll tell you what we'll do, you know, we'll, we think we've got the rights to the TV. That's the thing, we've got the rights to the TV. I said to Andrew Demetrius, say, well, give them the rights, mate. Give them a, tell you what we will do to the MCG, what we will go along and what we will give. We're committed to 35 games or whatever. We will give them. It will be Fremantle versus Adelaide. It will be every low attending game other than the 10 that we are required to do and they'll make no money and we'll put every good game down at uh, Telstra Dome as it was then. So you have to be, you had to be tougher with certain of these people to break the back of it. And your dad dis was very, very pleasant, your dad. But he was also very tough. And he had ability to say no, and occasionally you had to help him say no in a very tough way. When they offered the TV, we said, no, don't want that. Take it away, we'll go, to, we'll go somewhere else. We will break the... The, the the bank of tradition if if we have to in order to get a new tradition in order to get something new for the AFL better better payment for the players 
uh, better better stadiums. So that was the role, but you you know it was a different role. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, I enjoyed it most of the time. I enjoyed it. Some of them were really hard. I went with the judge and jury, Calm Footy Club. Those things they were really hard. You know, I, I thought some of those were. A lot of the other things I, I felt very hard. So, Bill, uh, last question because you've been incredibly generous uh, to me with your time. You've recently become a grandfather and and young Hunter. What can Hunter be um, optimistic about the future of Australia? What what do you think? Um, the future for Hunter and the future of Australia might be? I think Hunter's got good reason to be optimistic. This idea that the country, you know, is always going backwards, going to go backwards, um, it doesn't occur. When Michael was born, I, I sat there and I said, I said to Sue, the one thing we'll do with Michael is, is we will negotiate with other people to establish a position. He's got national health gear and national super and national wages. We will, we will change together the world for him to be better places. Not personally, but with other people. And and can you change the world to be a better place for other people? Is Hunter got a right to think the world will be a better place? Well, already he starts off with more money invested in education. Uh, uh, he already starts off with a better superannuation system. He already starts off with a better wages system. He already starts off entering life with a better better level of commitment to the environment. He starts on life with a better attitude to women in terms of our society than even the 1980s. That is, he's entering a world which by and large has significantly improved in terms of its views of the world, in terms of the environment and, and discrimination in Indigenous Australians. I mean, the world is a better place than even it was when Michael was born. So he enters that world. All these people want to write the country down and say no progress has been made. It's not true. Progress has been made. So the world is a better place. And he's going to enter a world a better place. Has he, has, are there risks? Of course there are risks. What you can't have is generation of generation after governments who do nothing. You know, these are the worst governments. As, as we discussed at Ronald Reagan's library, we said Ronald Reagan is one of the worst presidents in history. And it will prove in time, because we have a generation in which real, real wages won't improve, the healthcare system will stagnate, American people, the American people, living standards will decline year by year by half a percent, one percent, one percent, or not improve at all for generation. And then it'll start to decay upon itself and fight upon itself. And that's, Reagan, that's Reagan's essential contribution to the American society, the complete opposite to Roosevelt. And I'll give him some credit, as we did give him some points. We did give him credit for at least being able to say the right things in terms of the end of communism. I do give him credit for that. But you don't want a world in which there's no heroes, there's no progress... There's no people with sufficient energy and commitment to take the world up a next step and just live in a world of complacency where it's OK. It's OK. We're by and large never OK. You've got to make it improve things and do things better, whether it's the environment or attitude to women, Indigenous Australian. But I think Hunter, he'll live to see, he, will, he will live to see a treaty with Indigenous Australians. He will live to see super go to 12%. He will live to a society which invests more in education. He will live with a society with better commitments in terms of the environment. He's living in a society now that you treat women equally. That's the society he will live in. And unless we do something incredibly stupid internationally, then that's the world we're going to live in. Because I know I'm no Liberal Party supporter, as you know. But there haven't been... The greatest problem is... They're not visionaries, but they're not brand managers either. So occasionally it doesn't matter to have people who just manage. But occasionally you, not, you need a bit more energy, a bit more vision, a bit more bravery. And that's what, uh, if we're lacking anything, that's what we're lacking. The next steps. The next steps. Now they're there, so I'm only optimistic, to be honest. That's not to say not problems. 
You know, not, there's, there's some serious problems. But you, oh, I actually feel proud. You know, I, I actually felt proud of Adam Goods. I mean, I, I'm running around watching footy, I felt proud of Burgoyne. I, I felt proud of all the Indigenous players and how much love you have for them. Because I remember in the 1980s talking to Kevin Sheedy, and Kevin said, you know, the Indigenous people, I was wrong about them. Everybody tells, get Michael Long down to Essendon, Michael Long, Long's got to accommodate the culture of white people, white Europeans. He said, Ron and I, the thing we did, we said to the Essendon Footy Club that it's not Michael Long's role to accommodate himself to us. We've got to accommodate us to Michael Long. And, and I think that gradually did shift. And, and your dad was one of those people. And when, when Kevin Sheedy said that with your dad, people laughed at him. People spoke ba badly of them. You know, they, they said terrible things about them because uh, they were leading a world view, a different view. Now, we just haven't done it yet, but we will get a treaty. Australia will be a better nation. We've got greater equality for women. You can't rape and assault women the same way you could badmouth them and do that. The society is changing by and large for the better. And you know, we've had the biggest improvement in living standards of any group of workers in the history of humanity in terms of the Chinese. I know they're a problem in money. But don't ignore all the good things. Don't ignore all the good things that Hunter is born into. Don't do that for anybody. Well, Bill, I think that's a great place to stop. It's uh, been a wonderful uh, chat with you. A lot of the stories that um, I've had the benefit of hearing over the, over the years you've been able to impart and more this afternoon. So it is uh, a great record now uh, of some of the, your achievements, but also some of the characters and some of the people you work with as well. As you rightly said, it was a team effort, but uh, it's been a privilege to do it. How have you found it? Oh, good. I you know, enjoy, enjoy talking to you. So we're talking to your mum. We've got great friends. Well, it's uh, very good of you to do it, and um, thanks for your time this afternoon.